um, and we were up here for that. And just got done with the finishing, cleaning up the dishes and stuff, and that's when we got the, the call for the anhydrous accident. We got called out for a tanker rollover, and that's pretty much all it described. It didn't say anything about any anhydrous or anything like that, so we, in route to the call, we were treating it like a normal call. We were all kind of just talking back and forth and talking about some of the stories the retired guys were saying, and just in route to the call like it was any other type of call that we got. We didn't expect it to be an actual bad rollover or any, anything of that sort, like an anhydrous rollover. I was on the first truck, 652 in, was heading in that direction when we got partially there and we was told to uh, evacuate and uh, pulled back to uh, closer to town to reassess, and that's when kind of I realized something was up. Uh, we heard the call uh, to uh, retreat back to the St. Francis Township Road. We stopped at the grade school where there was a turnaround, and we started directing traffic that was headed east through the Circle Drive to direct them back west. We could tell something was wrong, but we still didn't know what. Um, we were heading eastbound, and the downside was we couldn't just back up in a 30-foot truck with all the traffic behind us, so we had to actually get into the westbound lane and back our way down on the wrong lane of traffic to get turned around, and then we reported back to the first road here in town and staged, and then at that point, we finally figured out that it was an anhydrous leak. We kind of had a heads up of uh, that we were on standby for the neighboring department. Um, they were having some, some event and so we, we knew we were on standby. Um, I was at home on the couch just getting ready to watch some TV and uh, my wife heard the pager go off the tea town and she's like, hey, I know you said something about you're on, you know, you're on standby with them. So I heard that they got paged out for 18 year old male difficulty breathing and hydrous uh, leak. So I came up to the station, got ready. When we were heading that direction. I saw the tanker and they had like a, a little mist coming out of it. Uh, it looked like fog. I mean, just covering the whole area. Um, you can see headlights of vehicles that have crashed. Um, but other than that, you really just didn't see a lot because of the cloud. There was a little eerie looking. It was you know, a white fog basically that was just rolling on the ground and it was couple cars in the ditch with the doors flung open and it was pretty quiet. It was just, it was weird. So anhydrous ammonia is what uh, agricultural farming communities use to put in the ground when they get ready to plant corn. Uh, helps nit the nitrogen in the ground. Um, if it does leak, uh, it attacks your respiratory system, like your moisture glands and, and stuff of that nature and it just basically sucks the, the moisture out of your out of your body. It's an asphyxiant, it takes your takes your breath away, uh, it'll collect the moisture around your eyes and your mouth and basically swell your throat up to where you, you can't breathe anymore. Yeah, so when it released, people were still driving to and from um, on a road. So and then they were wrecking and then everybody just stopped. And then people just sat in a cloud because a lot of people from out of town, they probably never had to deal with this stuff before so they didn't know. We've had small uh, tankers roll over out in the country, like they pull behind an actual tractor with the implement, um, but most of the time that's out in the middle of an 80 acre field, it's a nice breezy day. Um, you know, most of the time those, you don't have to worry about a whole lot. That can just, within 20, 30 minutes, that's gone, the wind's pushed it out of the air, it's not harming anybody, but this situation being a bigger tanker, being at night, being that the wind was blowing straight towards town, I mean, there was there was a lot of bad things happening. As we started to evaluate the situation, decided we needed an ATV to go back in. I happened, me and uh, our, my Lieutenant Repking happened to be there, so we was fully packed up and we headed back in. It was really foggy, really hard to see. My chief was already up here. Um, he told me to stand by, he went forward. Found the truck driver that was hauling the anhydrous, um, having trouble seeing, breathing. So he called me and um, Drew Powell's up, because we we're both at the station. Um, called us up to the scene with our rescue, which is what's behind me. Uh, so we went up there, flushed out the guy's eyes, uh, gave him some, some sort of medical treatment. And then was decided that if 
he was there. We still had trucks lined up on an interstate or on the highway. So me and Drew decided to go ahead and go up closer to the to the hot zone. And when we got up there, a guy was uh, telling us that there were still victims laying in the grass. You know, never really knew where any of the victims were, how many, you know, where we were going to find them at. So just kind of as we walked in, I was scanning and looking, and we ended up finding some. We came across, myself and Dan came across a trucker. Um, he was kind of in distress, but he was walking. We brought him back to safety out of the hot zone. And he informed us there was one more. So we went back in, we, uh, we found him, pulled him back to the same spot, and then went back in. You could tell they were severely irritated by it. I mean, yeah, they had, they had uh, face masks that were holding themselves. One of them had a gallon of water as he was dumping on himself and was struggling, you can tell he was struggling to breathe and talk, but was also really relieved when we showed up. And then we went in a third time, and then that's when we found our first unconscious victim laying in the ditch. And then we really knew that this was going to start to get bad in a hurry. We got him back to the four-way here in town where, where an ambulance was stationed. We started performing CPR. And once the EMS took over, um, we was prepping to go back in. I was on low air, and uh, Firefighter Lee happened to be standing there. And I asked if he would be willing to go in. And so... He took over for me. Dan Coker, uh, his air pack was uh, com complete, so I was available, and um, I went in in the on, on the side by side with uh, Brett Repkin. Um, we headed we headed east towards Montrose, and we were going to do search and rescue. Um, we stopped. There was several semis. I, I believe there was two or three semis. Um, I went in the semi. The first one um, checked the bed, checked the cab, didn't see anybody. Uh, shut the engine off, shut the power off. We moved on to the next two and it was the same. Uh, no one was in the cab, no one was in the truck. Shut the engine off and we moved on. Um, and then we slowly worked our way up to the actual accident. And then that's when we met up with firefighter uh, from Montrose. Just a little eerie looking. It was you know, a white fog basically that was just rolling on the ground. And it was just a couple of cars in the ditch with the doors flung open and it was pretty quiet. It was just, it was, it was weird. So in Hydra City, my chief was already up here. Uh, we came across, myself and Dan came across a trucker. Um, he was kind of in distress, but he was walking. We brought him back to safety out of the hot zone. And he informed us there was one more. So we went back in, we, uh, we found him. Pulled him back to the same spot and then went back in. You could tell they were severely irritated by it. I mean, yeah, they had they had uh, face masks over holding themselves. One of them had a gallon of water as he was dumping on himself and was struggling. You can tell he was struggling to breathe and talk, but was also really relieved when we showed up. And then we went in a third time, and then that's when we found our first unconscious victim laying in the ditch. And then we really knew that this was going to start to get bad in a hurry. We got him back to the four-way here in town where, where an ambulance was stationed. We started performing CPR. And once the EMS took over, um, we was prepping to go back in. I was on low air. And uh, standing bravery and heroism, he is awarded the Firefighter Medal of Honor. And lastly, here is the story of Assistant Chief David Browning and Captain Drew Powles of the Montrose Fire Protection District and Lieutenant Brett Repking, Firefighter Dan Coker, and Firefighter Ryan Lee of the Teutopolis Fire Department, Fire Protection District.
Well, we were actually up here at the station for, uh, we have a party every year for our retired guys, um, and we were up here for that. And just got done with the, finished cleaning up the dishes and stuff, and that's when we got the, the call for the anhydrous accident. We got called out for a tanker rollover, and that's pretty much all it described. It didn't say anything about any anhydrous or anything like that, so we... En route to the call, we were treating it like a normal call. We were all kind of just talking back and forth and talking about some of the stories the retired guys were saying and just en route to the call like it was any other type of call that we got. We didn't expect it to be an actual bad rollover or any anything of that sort, like an anhydrous rollover. I was on the first truck, 652 in, was heading in that direction when we got partially there and we was told to uh, evacuate and uh, pulled back to uh, closer to town to reassess. And that's when kind of I realized something was up. Uh, we heard the call uh, to uh, retreat back to the St. Francis Township Road. We stopped at the grade school where there was a turnaround and we started directing traffic that was headed east to the Circle Drive to direct them back west. We could tell something was wrong, but we still didn't know what. Um, we were heading eastbound and the downside was we couldn't just back up in a 30-foot truck with all the traffic behind us so we had to actually get into the westbound lane and back our way down on the wrong lane of traffic to get turned around and then we reported back to the first road here in town and staged and then at that point we finally figured out that it was an anhydrous leak. We kind of had a heads up of uh, that we were on standby for the neighboring department um, they were having some some event and so we, we knew we were on standby. Um, I was at home on the couch, just getting ready to watch the TV. And uh, my wife heard the pager go off for T-Town. And she's like, hey, I know you said something about you're on, you know, you're on standby with them. So I heard that they got paged out for 18 year old male difficulty breathing and hydrous uh, leak. So I came up to the station, got ready. When we were heading that direction. I saw the tanker and they had like a, a little mist coming out of it. Uh, it looked like fog. I mean, just covering the whole area. Um, you can see headlights of vehicles that have crashed. Um, but other than that, you really just didn't see a lot because of the cloud. It was a little eerie looking. It was you know, a white fog basically that was just rolling on the ground and it was couple cars in the ditch with the doors flung open and it's pretty quiet it's just it's, it's weird so anhydrous ammonia is what uh, agricultural farming communities use to put in the ground when they get ready to plant corn uh, helps nit the nitrogen in the ground um, if it does leak uh, it attacks your respiratory system like your moisture glands and, and stuff of that nature and it just basically sucks the, the moisture out of your out of your body. It's an asphyxiant. It takes your takes your breath away. Uh, it'll collect the moisture around your eyes and your mouth, and basically swell your throat up to where you you can't breathe anymore. Yeah. So when it released, people were still driving to and from um, on a road. So and then they were wrecking, and then everybody just stopped, and then people just sat in a cloud because a lot of people were from out of town. They probably never had to deal with this stuff before. So they didn't know. We've had small uh, tankers roll over out in the country, like they pull behind an actual tractor with the implement. Um, but most of the time, that's out in the middle of an 80-acre field. It's a nice breezy day. Um, you know, most of the time, those you don't have to worry about a whole lot. That can just within 20, 30 minutes, that's gone. The wind's pushed it out of the air. It's not harming anybody. But this situation, being a bigger tanker, being at night being that the wind was blowing straight towards town. I mean, there was there was a lot of bad things happening. As we started to evaluate the situation, decided we needed an ATV to go back in. I happened, me and uh, our, my Lieutenant Repking happened to be there. So we was fully packed up and we headed back in. It was really foggy, really hard to see. My chief was already up here. Um, he told me to stand by, he went forward. Found the truck driver that was hauling the anhydrous, um, having trouble seeing, breathing. So he called me and um, Drew Powell's up, because we we're both at the station. Um, called us up to the scene with our rescue, which is what's behind me. Uh, so we went up there, flushed out the guy's eyes, 
um, gave him some some sort of medical treatment, and then was decided that if he was there, we still had trucks lined up on an interstate or on the highway. So me and Drew decided to go ahead and go up closer to the to the hot zone. And when we got up there, a guy was uh, telling us that there were still victims laying in the grass. You know, never really knew where any of the victims were, how many, you know, where we were going to find them at. So just kind of as we walked in, I was scanning and looking, and we ended up finding some. We came across, myself and Dan came across a trucker. Um, he was kind of in distress, but he was walking. We brought him back to safety out of the hot zone. And he informed us there was one more. So we went back in, we, uh, we found him, pulled him back to the same spot, and then went back in. You could tell they were severely irritated by it. I mean, now yeah, they had, they had uh, face masks over holding themselves. One of them had a gallon of water as he was dumping on himself and was struggling. You can tell he was struggling to breathe and talk, but was also really relieved when we the hot zone. And he informed us there was one more, so we went back in. We, uh, we found him, pulled him back to the same spot, and then went back in. You could tell they were severely irritated by it. I mean, yeah, they had, they had uh, face masks over holding themselves. One of them had a gallon of water as he was dumping on himself. And he was struggling, you can tell he was struggling to breathe and talk, but was also really relieved when we showed up. And then we went in a third time, and then that's when we found our first unconscious victim laying in the ditch, and then we really knew that this was going to start to get bad in a hurry. We got him back to the four-way here in town where, where an ambulance was stationed. We started performing CPR. And once the EMS took over, um, we was prepping to go back in. I was on low air. And uh, Firefighter Lee happened to be standing there. And I asked if he would be willing to go in. And so he took over for me. Dan Coker, uh, his air pack was uh, com complete. So I was available and um, I went in, in the, on, on the side by side. We came across, myself and Dan came across a trucker. Um, he was kind of in distress, but he was walking. We brought him back to safety out of the hot zone. And he informed us there was one more. So we went back in, we, uh, we found him, pulled him back to the same spot and then went back in. You could tell they were severely irritated by it. I mean, yeah, they had they had uh, face masks over holding themselves. One of them had a gallon of water as he was dumping on himself and was struggling. You can tell he was struggling to breathe and talk, but was also really relieved when we showed up. And then we went in a third time, and then that's when we found our first unconscious victim laying in the ditch, and then we really knew that this was going to start to get bad in a hurry. We got him back to the four-way here in town where, where an ambulance was stationed. We started performing CPR and once the EMS took over um, we was prepping to go back in I was on low air and uh, firefighter Lee happened to be standing there and I asked if he would be willing to go in and so he took over for me Dan Coker uh, his air pack was uh, com complete so I was available and um, I went in in the on on the side by side with uh, Brett Repkin, um, we headed we headed east towards Montrose, and we were going to do search and rescue. Um, we stopped. There was several semis. I, I believe there was two or three semis. Um, I went in the semi. The first one um, checked the bed, checked the cab, didn't see anybody. Uh, shut the engine off, shut the power off. We moved on to the next two, and it was the same. Uh, no one was in the cab. No one was in the truck shut the engine off and we moved on. Um, and then we slowly worked our way up to the actual accident. And then that's when we met up with firefighter uh, from Montrose, David Browning and Drew Powell's. Um, and we kind of met right at the same time as we were coming up to a vehicle with three victims um, on the north or the south side of the ditch, uh, all in distress. So that's when we started working to, to get those three victims out. And we took them east to Chief Chopper Overbeck of Montrose as he was flying patients out with helicopters. When we originally went in, we were gonna go in and then come back to um, our staging zone, but they had a staging zone on their side, so we, uh, we went and dropped them, it was a lot closer. 
they could barely breathe. Um, their eyes were all crusted over their mouth, had a lot of white crust on it. Um, you could tell they were getting really close to the point of being their throats completely swelled shut. They weren't going to be able to breathe anymore. T-Town came in with their ATV, which helped pull them out a lot quicker. There was less stress and work for us to get them out, so that was a lot of help. Our uh, ATV side-by-side -side is equipped with a, um, a stretcher on it, and we loaded them up, and we drove them out, and then when we went back in, uh, Montrose had a second stretcher, and it wouldn't fit on ours, uh, so I remember hopping up on the stretcher to hold it down so uh, they wouldn't slide off. So I held the, um, the head of the, uh, of the second person sat on the stretcher while, while uh, Brett drove him out. And then we went in for the, for the third person we knew was in the um, ditch. We both assisted uh, Montrose um, um, pulling him up out of the ditch onto our side by side. And at that time, we didn't have a stretcher, so um, I held her in uh, my arms and Brett drove and we got her out. And um, that's when I ran out of the air and Brett went back in. Um, I, I wasn't really thinking of what we were doing here. It was it was happening so quick. It was just, you just do it. And and we were the ones that were there to, to do it. And we were fortunate enough, we had Montrose on the other side. Um, and it, it was a great team effort. Everybody, I mean, it wasn't just the people that went in to the hot zone. It, it was the whole, both departments. They, they, I believe everybody did a great job. With Dan Coker and myself, we pulled out three victims, one of them being the one we had to do CPR on at the four-way. And then myself and Ryan Lee and Drew Powell's and David Browning pulled the other three victims out of the, the vehicle up by the accident and got them safely to, to the helicopter. There was already one, two fatalities by the time we even got there. So, um, and then Titopolis, they found like two or three fatalities. And then in the morning, we found another fatality. As much as we don't like seeing those things, it's part of the job. And some days can be tougher than others. Granted, I've only been on two years. I've seen quite a bit. But, yeah, that was, that was pretty one I'll never forget. Later on that evening after everything calmed down and we had some time, we got deconned and we got out of our packs and we were just kind of sitting there later on that evening trying to figure out what to do with what was left in that tanker. I think it slowly kind of kind of set in on me on, you know, what could have happened and a lot of things that we were very lucky on. I mean, if, if our truck would have stalled out when we first drove into that incident, you know, myself and the other six guys in that truck could have been harmed very badly. I don't know if you could ever be prepared for, for something of that. Uh, magnitude I guess per se I mean that I feel like we treated that call very well I don't think there was anything that we as a department could have changed much that would have changed the outcome of, of any of that really um, but like I said looking back there was a lot of things that that did go right that we I wouldn't say got lucky on but we were we were very fortunate that nothing did happen like I said our truck didn't stall out our packs didn't fail there was there was a lot of things that happened right that that were in our favor for sure I, I honestly believe that it just went as as good as it was going to get. I, I just don't see anything different that could have been done to change any outcome. I would say the quick thinking, our leadership, our guys we got, our chiefs, our assistant chiefs, even our captain lieutenants, right? all the quick thinking by them to make the decisions needed was like, what I felt was really helpful. We just got a really good group of guys here. All, everybody's willing to step in and do what's needed to be done. Thanks for watching. Stick around by subscribing today and don't miss a single video.